This is the final sample lesson, lesson number seven of the total 74 lessons in the full series of audio lessons for the Series 7 Top-Off Study Guide audio lessons for the new Series 7 exam. This lesson is on MSRB advertising and FINRA rules, the first of many lessons you're going to be having on FINRA rules. It's a fairly short lesson. It's 17 minutes and 41 seconds. As I said, this is the final sample lesson. Hopefully you found these lessons valuable, and if you have, please go to the website, series7podcast.com, and purchase the full bundle of lessons. Welcome to the Series 7 Top-Off Exam Audio Lessons. This is lesson number seven. In this lesson, we're going to be covering a hodgepodge of <laughs> FINRA rules you need to understand. The big difference between the new Series 7, the Top-Off Series 7 examination, and the old Series 7 examination is the number of rules and regulations that you're expected to have a little bit of understanding in. This is very dry material, and even though there's not a lot of questions in this section, this is the first section of the outline, there's still a lot of material. So we don't know where they're going to draw their questions from, but there's a lot of material and a lot of rules and regulations that you need to, to understand. The first one we're going to be talking about is MSRB Rule G-21, which deals with advertising uh, for municipal bonds or college savings plans. And I found a fairly good summary of it. And I think I'm just going to share that with you. I'll try to paraphrase it where I can. But this is material that is just boring as can be. And a lot of it is just trying to remember the basics of these rules and regulations. So let's start out with MSRB Rule G-21. So this one's basically... Advertising disclosures, what you can advertise, how much you need to disclose when you're advertising, advertising on radio, advertising for 529 college plans, that sort of thing. So let's just start out and talk about it. Rule G21 is on advertising. It establishes specific requirements for advertisements by brokers, dealers, and municipal securities dealers of municipal fund securities, including but not limited to advertisements for 529 college savings plans. So we're going to be talking about time-limited broadcast, blind advertisements, and annual reports. First of all, this rule is sort of a rule that's talking about the intent and not so much about the specifics, and which I think is the way most rules should be. Because let me read this first paragraph to you. Rule G21 requires certain basic disclosures to be provided in product advertisements for municipal fund securities. These disclosures, not legends, requiring the inclusion of specific language. Rather, these disclosures requirements may be complied with if the substance of the information is effectively conveyed, regardless of the specific language used. In general, the context in which the information is provided is an important factor in determining whether the information is conveyed. Broadcast advertisements, and they talk about it as time-limited advertisements. And it says, these required disclosures may present challenges in the context of broadcast advertisements, such as traditional television or radio commercials with 30-second run times or public service announcements with shorter run times. In the context of time-limited broadcast advertisements, dealers should provide such disclosures in a manner that appropriately balances the intended message with the required disclosures. Given the unique nature of broadcast advertisements, where the oral presentation of more information can often result in a decreased likelihood that the central message of such information will be understood and retained, somewhat abbreviated forms of required disclosures may be appropriate for such time-limited broadcast advertisements, particularly if the disclosures are made 
with close attention paid to ensuring that they are presented with equal prominence to the remainder of the message. And then it goes on to give an example. Say, for example, in a time-limited broadcast advertisement for a non-money market 529 plan, the following language spoken in a manner consistent with the remaining oral presentation of information generally would satisfy the disclosure requirements of Rule G21. And then it quotes, To learn about 529 plans, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the official statement available from... XYZ Broker Corporation. Check with your home state to learn if it offers tax or other benefits for investing in its own 529. Okay. And then it goes on to say another example. In a time-limited television advertisement, the source of the official statement, together with the contact number or web address, generally could be displayed on screen while other portions of the disclosure are spoken. All right, then it goes on and we talk about blind advertisements. Under Rule G21, certain product advertisements for municipal fund securities that promote an issuer and its public purpose without promoting specific municipal fund securities or identifying its dealer or its affiliates may omit the general disclosures otherwise required under Rule G21. Among other things, such a blind advertisement may include contact information for the issuer or an agent of the issuer to obtain an official statement or other information, provided that such issuer's agent is a dealer or dealer affiliate. No orders may be accepted through such source unless indicated by the customer. Although the contact information may direct a potential customer to its dealer or its affiliate, acting as an agent to the issuer, the face of the advertisement may not identify such dealer or affiliate. And then it goes on to say, and this, is, this would be in a printed advertisement. For example, call 800-123-12345 for more information or go to, or go to www.thestatesname-529plan.com or whatever the website address might be for more information, but may not say call dealer name. Bob's Brokerage Firm at 800-519-1111 for more information or go to www.dealername-529plan for more information. So you can't be dealer specific in those advertisements. Now it goes on to say this provision does not preclude the person who answers the phone or the website to which the URL link the dealer or its affiliate so long as such dealer or affiliate is clearly disclosed to be acting on behalf of the issuer identified in the advertisement. Now, what if a customer that responds to an advertisement becomes a customer and initiates an order? Let's read this section. If a potential customer initiates an order through the source identified in the advertisement, a distinct barrier between the providing of information and the seeking of orders must be maintained to qualify as a blind advertisement. For example, solely for the purposes of Rule G21, a dealer may establish that a customer initiated the order by requiring, in the case of a telephone inquiry, that the customer be transferred from the initial dealer contact person to a different person before the customer provides any information used in connection with an order, or in the case of a web-based inquiry that the customer navigate from the initial web page referred to in the advertisement to another page on the same or different website before entering any information used in connection with the order. And then it goes on to say, of course, the dealer must be mindful of its obligation under Rule G17 on fair practice to provide the customer at or prior to the time of trade all material facts about the transaction known by the dealer as well as material facts about the security that are reasonably accessible to the market regardless of whether the transaction was recommended or whether an order may be characterized as unsolicited. In addition, if the transaction is recommended, the dealer must fulfill its obligations with respect to suitability under Rule G-19 on suitability of recommendations and transactions. And then it goes on to state that in some cases, a dealer may be required by state law or rules and regulations adopted by the state governing particular 529 plans 
and that sometimes the information required by the state is not considered advertisements for the purpose of G-21. But that's specific to a state-by-state -state case and not something you really need to know. I think that's all you need to learn about MSRB Rule G-21. All right, we're going to be talking about FINRA Rule 3160, networking arrangements between members and financial institutions. So this is talking about if XYZ brokerage firm happens to set up a desk in, let's say, another bank. And this is talking about the standards for those sort of arrangements. So setting, a member that conducts broker-dealer services on the premises of a financial institution shall be clearly identified as the person providing broker-dealer services and shall distinguish its broker-dealer services from the services of the financial institution. So if you set up your XYZ brokerage firm in the offices of ABC Bank, you need to identify that you are working for XYZ brokerage services and you just happen to have a desk at that bank. All right. So you have to clearly display the member's name. And then it goes on to say, to the extent practical, maintain its broker-dealer services in a location physically separate from the routine retail deposit-taking activities of the financial institution. Then it goes on to say that if you enter in this sort of an agreement, it needs to be in writing that sets forth the responsibilities of the parties, and it meets all the SEC regulations that deal with contractual obligations. And the member shall, and it stipulates that the supervisory personnel of the member or representatives of the SEC and FINRA will be permitted access to the financial institution's premises where the member conducts broker-dealer services. So in other words, they have to provide SEC and FINRA access to that location office. Then it has to be stated, and customer disclosures have to be made, that it's not insured by the FDIC, that any deposits are not guaranteed by the financial institution where it's being located, and that its investments are subject to risks, including the possible loss of principal. Big thing, it's not FDIC insured, there's no bank guarantee, and may lose value. So those disclosures must be made by the broker-dealer working, let's say, in a bank. And then it also covers advertising, billboards, and signs. All right, that's enough on Rule 3160. Rule 3170. I'm going to read this directly. It's fairly short and straightforward. Effective December 1st, 2014, FINRA Rule 3170, tape recording of registered persons by certain firms commonly referred to as the taping rule, was adopted in the consolidated FINRA rulebook, replacing the previous rule. The taping rule provisions first became effective August 17, 1998, when the Securities and Exchange Commission approved an amendment to NASD Rule 3010 to require members to establish, enforce, and maintain special written supervisory procedures, including the tape recording of conversations when they have hired more than a specified percentage of registered persons from certain firms that have been expelled or have had their broker-dealer registrations revoked for violations of sales practices rules, in other words, disciplined firms. These provisions were reconstituted without substantive change into Rule 3170. So basically, if you hired a bunch of um, people that have been disciplined in the past, you are going to be setting up taping procedures to tape their conversations so they can be replayed and make sure they are uh, conducting themselves in an appropriate manner. Let's talk about Rule 5110. This is called the Corporate Financing Rule, Underwriting Terms and Arrangements. All right, let's talk about Rule 5110, the Corporate Financing Rule. So this rule prohibits members from participating in offerings in which the underwriting or other arrangements are unreasonable or excessive. In other words, if the underwriters are making too much money or it's unreasonable, it prohibits members from participating in these offerings, and it requires 
FINRA members to file specified information about the offering, which may not proceed until FINRA has provided its clearance. So there may be offerings that are exempt from these filing requirements, but not from the rule standard of fairness and reasonableness. So here are the filing requirements. Unless there is an exemption, documents and information must be filed with FINRA for every public offering of securities. It enables FINRA's corporate financing department to pass on the fairness and reasonableness of the offering arrangements. Then it defines a public offering of any registered or non-registered primary or secondary distribution that, that constitutes a public offering. Exclusion for private placements specified in the Securities Act of 1933 under Regulation S. There's a $500 filing fee plus 1% of the proposed maximum aggregate offering price of the offering not to exceed a fee of $75,500. I'm sure you don't need to know that. This also deals with shelf registration statements. You'll learn about shelf registrations later on. FINRA does reserve the right to review any transaction on a post-offering basis. Here's some exemptions from Rule 5110. Securities registered with the SEC on Form S-3 or Form F-3 and offered pursuant to the self-registrations. This applies to 1934 Act reporting history of 36 months. Company must have a public float of $150 million or $100 million and an annual trading volume of 3 million shares if it's a U.S. company. If it's a non-U.S. company, it must have a public float of $300 million. Rule 5110 has some standards, and this is probably one that you might want to pay attention to. Since June 2012, FINRA has note in its public offering system that total proposed underwriting compensation that does not exceed 8% of the offering proceeds will be presumed to be fair and reasonable. In addition, FINRA has internal guidelines. The maximum permissible percentage compensation will vary depending on the overall size of the deal and the amount of risk borne by the underwriters. In general, the bigger the deal, the less the compensation. The amount of risk taken by the underwriters, the more compensation. So, for instance, if you do a firm underwriting commitment, there would be assumed to be a higher commission or fee that the underwriters could earn. For IPOs, they consider 7% underwriting discount to be customary. And if it's over 9%, they look at that as a red flag. This basically deals with mostly arrangements for the underwriting of securities. What about mutual funds? Mutual funds are continuously offering shares for sale at net asset value plus the sales charge. That's one of the exceptions, I think, that is referred to in this rule. All right, that's going to finish up this lesson. All right, thanks for listening to this sample lesson. If you decide you want to purchase the full bundle of audio lessons, go to series7podcast.com, and that's series and the number seven, so series and the number seven podcast.com. Click on the Series 7 Top-Off Study Guide, Audio Lessons for the New Series 7 Exam, and it will take you to a service called Gumroad. Gumroad will take your credit card information and then send you an email link where you are allowed to listen to or download the MP3 files. Let me suggest, strongly suggest, that you take the time to download the individual audio files into your computer. The total length of this full series of audio lessons is 32 hours and 27 minutes. So download all the MP3 files to your computer and then take the time to upload the individual MP3 files that you want to listen to back to your listening device. This would take up a lot of storage space to put the full series of audio lessons onto your listening device. I provide in the download a PDF document which explains how to go through the process of downloading the MP to your computer and then uploading them into your listening device. And I'm assuming by listening device, you're talking about an iPhone or another smartphone of some sort. You can also do it into the old-fashioned iPods if you want to do that. 
Gumroad does have an app which you can use to listen to the audio lessons, but I <laughs> I think you will have a lot of problems using the app. It has not been updated in quite a few years. I'm hoping that Sahil Lavinga, the founder of Gumroad, will be upgrading this app in the near future. But until then, if you want to purchase the full series of audio lessons, the best way to do it is to download it into your computer and then upload the individual MP3 files into your listening device. Now, a lot of people have asked me why I don't put the full series of audio lessons out on, let's say, a service like Audible or iTunes. Well, if I did that, they take such a big portion of my revenues that I would probably have to more than double the price that I charge you for this series of audio lessons. I try to keep the price reasonable and affordable to you. And if I uploaded it to those services, I would get, I just wouldn't get enough to justify the trouble that I go through to put these audio lessons together. All right. Best of luck in your studies. I hope you find these audio lessons useful.